All right, so the reason for the existence of atmospheric pressure is simply because we live at the bottom of an ocean of air. And so this ocean of air exerts uh, force on us and that is what causes the atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure acts in all directions. Pressure is a scalar, so it doesn't have any particular direction. So the atmospheric pressure acts in all directions. What is the value of the atmospheric pressure? Um, the formula for pressure is force per unit area, right? So if you hold up an area of one square meter, the atmosphere is going to exert a force of 101 300 newtons on this one square meter area, right? So the atmospheric pressure becomes 101 300 newtons. So this is the force exerted by the atmosphere. So this much force divided by the area one square meter. And so that's going to be 101 300 pascals. And that is the value of the atmospheric pressure. Now you might think that on a, if I just hold up a one square meter area and there is this much force acting on it, 101 300 newtons, how come I never notice it? Um, the reason you never notice it is because atmospheric pressure acts in all directions. So there is also the same amount of force acting on the bottom of this area as well. And so that is why this area that you're holding up is not going to feel any force, any net force, because the same amount of force acts on it from both directions. All right. Now, there are some alternative units of pressure. There are actually many units of pressure. So Pascal is one unit. Another unit of pressure is the atmosphere. And one atmosphere is equal to 101, 300 Pascals. So it makes sense to measure the atmospheric pressure in atmospheres. So one atmosphere has this particular value, 101, 300 uh, Pascals. If the atmospheric pressure happens to be a little higher than that, then it, it's, it might be 1.1 atmosphere or something like that, 1.01 atmospheres or something like that. So an atmosphere is also an alternative unit for measuring pressure. Yet another unit for measuring pressure is the pounds per square inch. So what is that? If you hold up an area of one square inch, the atmosphere is going to exert a force of about 15 pounds, the equivalent of 15 pounds on this one square inch area. And so that's another unit of pressure, the pounds per square inch. And uh, the atmospheric pressure corresponds to 15 pounds per square inch. All right. So is this a large pressure? To answer this question, I would recommend that you click on this video and watch this video first, right? Feel free to pause this video and watch this one. Unfortunately, I can't show it. Uh, I can't click on this video now because YouTube doesn't like uh, videos, YouTube videos with, within videos. And so, so please watch this very short clip. You will find what happens in this clip is the following. There is a train compartment which is completely airtight. And this train compartment just completely implodes. That's what you see in the video. It spectacularly implodes a giant metallic iron train compartment, which probably weighs several hundred tons, uh, implodes. Why does it implode? The way it's done is that the compartment, the train compartment is filled with steam, right? So the, when you fill it with steam, all the air, a lot of the air in the train compartment is uh, comes out and is replaced by steam. And then you shut the compartment and it's completely airtight so the steam stays inside. Now steam will eventually condense to water, right? And water takes up much less space than steam. As a result of that, you have a partial vacuum inside this compartment because a lot of the steam has now disappeared and turned into water. And so there is much lower pressure inside than outside. Outside you've got atmospheric pressure. As a result of that, you have atmospheric pressure on the outside, much lower pressure on the inside. So the force from the outside in is much greater than the force from the inside out. And as we discussed in class, whenever you have a pressure difference, the net force turns out to be the area multiplied by the pressure difference. And if you do that, uh, 
the net force becomes the area multiplied by delta p so the area is pretty large and delta p can also be pretty large because the pressure inside is pretty low much lower than the atmospheric pressure and so the force turns out to be enormous enough to completely crush this train compartment all right so this is a pretty nice public demonstration um, and it basically goes on to show us that the atmospheric pressure is quite large uh, but we don't notice it because we are used to it. Um, you might sometimes notice atmospheric pressure, like if you were to uh, rapidly go up, change your elevation, like suppose you, you're in a car and you rapidly drive up to the top of a hill, you might at that point notice that, the, that you're feeling a bit uncomfortable or your ears are popping. What's going on is that when you were at the base of the hill, the pressure inside your body and outside your body was the same. It was atmospheric pressure at the base of the hill. Now, atmospheric pressure at the top of the hill might be a little bit lower because the pressure goes down with elevation. And so when you get to the top of the hill, the pressure inside your body is still what it was at the bottom of the hill, but your pressure outside you has gone down. And as a result of that, uh, you feel, you can sense that there is something wrong and uh, you're, uh, you, you have this sense, distinct sensation, um, uh, you feel all this, uh, you, you have this weird feeling um, and, and eventually you will feel normal after your ears pop. Your ears are actually responsible for equalizing the pressure inside and outside your body and so eventually you'll feel uh, normal. Okay, all right. Now I'm just going to briefly talk about how pressure can be measured using a device called a barometer. So a barometer is any device that measures pressure. I'm going to talk about the mercury barometer, which is no longer used these days, but it, it's a very simple device and it's the first device that was used to measure atmospheric pressure. So to make a mercury barometer is very simple. All you need is a tube uh, and some mercury, a lot of mercury. So the first thing that you do is you fill up this tube with mercury. So I have that right here, fill up this tube with mercury and carefully fill it up so that there's absolutely no air bubbles and it's completely filled up. Once the tube is completely filled up, you put a stop on top of, at the top of the tube so that the mercury cannot escape. Once again, make absolutely certain there's no air bubbles. Then invert the tube in a pan of mercury. That's what's being done over here. So at first you might think that all the mercury is now gonna flow out, right? But what happens is that the mercury flows out to some extent, but there is a then it stops flowing out and you have this persistent column of mercury uh, which just remains it just doesn't flow out anymore and the height of this mercury will remain the same you can also tilt the tube to one side the mercury height will always stay the same um, this was first done by a person named Torricelli and so this is called Torricelli's experiment and so what do we have directly above the mercury right here? Can you think what we have right here? What we have is just vacuum um, because uh, there might be some mercury atoms floating around, but it's mostly vacuum. So this is called Torricelli's vacuum. All right, so why is the mercury not flowing out? Why does this column of mercury persist and why does it not all flow out? To understand that, let's consider a point in the second diagram bottom diagram let's consider a point over here let's call this point b so b is inside the mercury column and let's consider any point over here on the surface of the mercury in the pan let's call that point a all right now since a and b are at the same height they should have the same pressure you can see that because you know that the entire liquid is at rest entire all the mercury is at rest so if A and B did not have the same pressure, then there would be some flow of liquid from A to B or B to A, but we don't have any flow of liquid anywhere. So that means A and B, which are at the same height, must have exactly the same pressure, right? So pressure at B must be equal to the pressure at A. Now, what is the pressure at A? Clearly, the pressure at A is just the atmospheric pressure, right? What is the pressure at B? The pressure at B is caused by the column of mercury directly above B. And above that column of mercury, there is nothing. There's vacuum, right? So the pressure at B is exclusively 
due to the column of mercury. We know how to find the pressure at a certain depth underneath the surface of a liquid. So the pressure at B is just going to be, if we, if the, if we call this height H, H is the height of the mercury column multiplied by the density of mercury multiplied by G. And so we get this expression. Now, the height of the mercury column you can easily measure experimentally. It's typically around 76 centimeters. You know the density of mercury. Uh, you can look it up. I think it's 13,100, uh, if I remember correctly, um, uh, kgs per meter cubed, though I'm not 100% sure of this. And this is, uh, G is 9.8, so you can multiply these together and you should get the atmospheric pressure. So this gives you a very clever experimental way of measuring atmospheric pressure. All you have to do is measure the height of the mercury column. Another thing that you notice from here is that the height of the mercury column is directly proportional to the atmospheric pressure. So you can also use this device if you already have it set up. You can use this device to monitor the atmospheric pressure because the atmospheric pressure is directly proportional to the height of the mercury column. So on a certain day, if the atmospheric pressure is a little bit higher than usual, the mercury column will rise up. If the atmospheric pressure is lower than usual, the mercury column will go down because in this equation you can see that H must be directly proportional to the atmospheric pressure. So this is called the mercury barometer and for many many centuries it was actually uh, yeah for since the 1700s so around two centuries or so it was used to measure atmospheric pressure. There are better methods now uh, using so much mercury is, is a health hazard. Um, but you can use um, this device to accurately measure the atmospheric pressure. All right, now, I, we talked about units of pressure before. This particular setup um, inspires a couple of more units of pressure. One of them is CMHG. What is CMHG? CMHG is the pressure that would be caused by a one centimeter column of mercury. So if you have a one centimeter column of mercury, the pressure that would be caused by that is one CMHG. You can easily use the formula pressure equals H rho G to calculate that. So H would be one centimeter, rho would be the density of mercury, G would be 9.8. So you can calculate what one CMHG would be in, in Pascals if you want. But CMHG is used to, um, to as a unit of atmospheric pressure. So what is the normal atmospheric pressure going to be? Normally the, the column of mercury is around 76 centimeters tall. 76 centimeters tall. So um, normal atmospheric pressure is around 76 CMHG. All right. If the atmospheric pressure is a little bit higher or lower, it might be 77 or 78 CMHG or 74 CMHG and so on. So CMHG is a con convenient way of convenient unit to express atmospheric pressure. Another unit that's often uh, used is MMHG. MMHG just means the pressure due to a one millimeter column of mercury. And you can convert it into Pascals in exactly the same way. Just make H one millimeter, rho is rho of mercury, G is 9.8. And so that is an MMHG. So these are just two other units of measuring pressure.